Chapter 5. Deleted. We are live, Ivory here. Hello, everyone. I'm afraid we don't have time for our traditional opening. We need to get right to the message. As I've been reporting, while propaganda legacy media remain silent, for a few weeks now on a United Nations job board they have been hiring weapons enforcement collectors. When asked, they say it is not for work in the United States but other regions around the world. Well, now the day every patriot feared has begun. Howard has thrown out our Constitution and signed a United Nations small weapon ban. Be ready and stay informed. This channel will be removed, just as hundreds of others have been in previous days. I am fairly confident it will happen before this broadcast ends. Chatboard is going crazy and I know how you feel, but also cannot tell you what to do. You must decide for yourself. Navigating her computer screen with practiced ease, Ivory deftly switched between tabs until she brought up a contributing web page. Wait, what's this? Oh, this is interesting and frightening. As you probably remember, the administration prior to Jackson taking office built massive FEMA camps, divided the country into ten regions, and massive amounts of white armored vehicles were seen traveling all over. All the while, we were told, nothing to see here, this is totally normal. For the last four years of Jackson's presidency, nobody thought any more of them as these normal events stopped. First, isn't it amazing how it just stops when a president is elected that doesn't want to take away our freedoms? Well, from what I am seeing here, wait, where did it go? That is interesting and scary. Well, it appears the article has been removed. Damn it, I told you we must move fast, this is why. Articles and reports are being censored. All that is discussed by legacy media is the massacre at Squire's Ranch, and as you know, I find real problems with believing that BS of a story. As you know, since Howard has taken over military training missions have resumed in Texas, taking place among civilian population. Well, this article that apparently was just removed spoke of an Army National Guard unit, the 138th Infantry Unit out of Missouri. Waiter! Yes, found it! Hold on, this isn't how the article read earlier. It appears this entire unit was arrested by a General Womack for conspiracy to overthrow Howard's presidency. Somehow these men got loose and massacred civilians celebrating their arrest in downtown Forest Park, St. Louis. Folks, the article that was just scrubbed said something quite different. It read... In a sudden twist, her screen faded into emptiness, her once popular channel disappearing as if it had never existed. What remained was a gnawing unease in the pit of her stomach. Despite the predictability of the event, considering the removal of similar channels, it did little to alleviate the gut-wrenching sensation. The years poured into nurturing her channel had been erased within moments, leaving behind an emptiness that cut deep. Unwilling to simply give up, Ivory inputted her information under a new email address, only to discover no new accounts were allowed on the platform. So not only are they deleting accounts, but they're ensuring none return. Isn't that just sketchy? Talking to herself, she mused, her fingers moving swiftly across the keyboard. She navigated through various YouTube channels similar to hers, hoping to uncover more comprehensive information about the ongoing events. With each click on a channel from her list, an eerie sense of déjà vu settled in as the screen remained frustratingly blank, displaying only the enigmatic message. No user. There has to be someone still on here with information, she thought while typing in the search box. Missouri 138th, hoping to find some information on the last subject she spoke of before losing her channel. Scrolling through video after video, nothing close to relevant appeared. Slightly discouraged, she began trying other keywords in the search, till finally she spotted a cell phone video titled, Forest Park Protest. The video lasted only 60 seconds, a fleeting span of time that held immense significance. Prior to even hitting the play button, she recognized the urgency of preserving it. Swiftly, her finger clicked the download option, securing the clip onto her computer's storage, a preemptive move driven by the fear that it might vanish, lost to the vagaries of online tides. Once the download completed, anticipation gnawing at her, she pressed the play icon. Every pixel held a story, every fleeting motion etched a detail. With rapt attention, she absorbed every frame, every nuance, as if decoding secrets hidden within. 
The video commenced mere moments before a military officer fired his pistol into the air. This single gunshot acted as a catalyst, setting off an alarming chain reaction of gunfire from multiple soldiers, easily identifiable by the armbands labeling them as MPs. In a stunning and unexpected twist, within seconds, civilians also joined the skirmish, retaliating with a barrage of their own shots directed at the MPs. The unfolding scene was chillingly nightmarish, amplifying the tragedy as the camera operator, caught in the crossfire, was hit by a stray bullet. The camera's view abruptly plummeted, bearing witness to the chaotic events from the ground. From that point the gunfire halted, and another person appeared filming. I am Kate, one of those who took action against and out of control military and government. These actions cannot stand. The men and women of the 138th did not cause this. Your government did. Don't let them lie about what happened here. Get the truth out. While Ivory absorbed the words of the women in the video, her gaze remained fixed on Kate's camera work, capturing the grim tableau of the wounded and lifeless, tended to by men who were previously meant to be detained. Confusion gnawed at her as she grappled with the unfolding scenario. What in the world was happening? After meticulously replaying the video multiple times, Ivory concluded that, given the magnitude of what had transpired, her best course of action at this late hour was to seek respite in sleep. Over the following days, Ivory made a conscious effort to divert her thoughts from the unsettling deletion of her channel. Instead, she channeled her energy into enacting a contingency plan she had fervently wished would never come to fruition, utilizing email communication. With unwavering resilience, she dedicated nearly 24 consecutive hours to tirelessly updating her website's content. She diligently posted videos and disseminated an abundance of information, leaving no stone unturned. And then, with everything in place, she initiated the distribution of email notifications, ensuring her audience remained informed and engaged. Satisfied with her dedicated efforts on the Forest Park video, she confidently pressed the button, initiating the distribution of tens of thousands of notifications to past viewers. As she leaned back in her office chair, a sense of gratification washed over her. The relief that accompanies knowing she was providing essential information to others settled deep within her. With her eyes gently shut and her arms resting on the chair's armrests, Ivory centered her attention on her breath. This technique one she frequently was recommended by soldiers with PTSD she had interviewed as a journalist, now proved remarkably efficacious as she utilized the IT herself. She was just seconds away from achieving genuine relaxation when the abrupt sound of a sizable vehicle coming to a halt outside pierced her consciousness, interrupting her tranquility. Still relaxed, Ivory sat up slowly before turning her head slightly to look out her office window. Jared! Ivory's frantic cry pierced the once serene atmosphere, shattering it into oblivion. The tranquility that had embraced them dissipated in an instant, leaving no trace of its fleeting presence. A colossal white vehicle, adorned with stark blue letters spelling out UN, materialized directly in front of their home. The phrase, Weapons Enforcement, was emblazoned on its front fender, casting a foreboding shadow over the scene. In a blur of urgency, Jared thundered into the room, his presence a reassurance in the midst of turmoil. The tableau froze in tension as two men emerged from the ominous vehicle, their intentions yet concealed. What? You okay? Jared quickly asked. While her heart raced, Ivory's mind raced in tandem, urgently weighing the options of hiding, fleeing, or confronting whoever was at the door. The purpose of their visit was crystal clear in her mind, and with every beat of her heart, she envisioned herself standing her ground, doling out retribution one bullet at a time. But now, fear took precedence, eclipsing all other thoughts as she managed to croak out a response. Look! While her trembling finger pointed towards the outside. Shit, shit, shit! We have to go now! Jared said while grabbing her wrist to get her moving. Sensing his firm grip upon her, Ivory shifted her gaze from the window and fell in step behind him as they traversed their home toward the rear exit. She felt a sense of relief, grateful that the burden of making the decision to flee rested on both their shoulders. Damn it! 
They're back here also, Jared's voice rang out as their brief sprint reached its conclusion. The tension in his words was palpable. With a furrowed brow, Ivory inquired, What now? Jared's gaze was fixed on the scene unfolding outside, his eyes narrowing as he observed two armed soldiers, their unmistakable blue helmets standing out in the backyard. The gravity of the situation was not lost on either of them. Their peaceful refuge had been invaded, and their choices were narrowing. Before Ivory could react, a pair of distinct knocks reverberated from the front door. These knocks held an unmistakable tone, far removed from the friendly requests for a cup of sugar from neighbors. Well, I am guessing we either answer the door or wait till they break it down. Ivory remarked, her voice a mixture of dry humor and genuine concern. She looked to Jared, secretly hoping he might offer a more creative solution. But as he drew near, their bodies instinctively seeking comfort in each other's embrace, she could feel the weight of their impending decision. His gentle kiss spoke volumes, conveying what their hearts were dictating. They reluctantly disentangled. The urgency of the situation underscored by the increasingly forceful knocks that reverberated through their home. Each knock seemed to punctuate the limited options before them. I'm coming, wait a damn minute, Jared called out as he neared the door. Stopping just inside their living room watching her husband about to open the door, she thought, should I get my gun? However, by that point, it had become an irreversible situation. Jared cautiously cracked the door open, but before he could react, it was violently shoved ajar, and three soldiers surged into the room, their presence overwhelming. Up against the wall, they demanded with strong European accents. Before either could say a word, two of the men had zip ties around their hands, asking, We apologize for restraints, but we have become much cautious since starting mission. Now where are firearms? Almost instinctively, Ivory and her husband both looked to the other with a smirk as to say silently, I'm not telling. You will comply, or we find them ourselves. You have two pistols and one AR-15, must I read serial numbers? The UN soldier asked, looking at his clipboard. Suddenly, Ivory began laughing uncontrollably. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wahaha. Sorry. This is all so ridiculous. But you also think we would know serial numbers. Wahaha. Unable to resist, Jared jumped in laughing with her. Silence! Take them out, we will locate them! Go! Angrily, the UN soldier with clipboard ordered. Acting on his orders, they yanked Ivory and Jared forcefully away from the living room walls, propelling them toward the exit. Take it easy, for God's sake. Jared's voice sliced through the tension as he witnessed his wife stumble. Stepping outside, the sight before them revealed that they were not the sole targets of this neighborhood visitation. The street was lined with a fleet of white vehicles, an undeniable sign that their block had experienced a collective intrusion. Soldiers were already making their way from house to house, their hands gripping confiscated weapons, some handed over without a struggle. A short distance down the street, Ivory observed a group of individuals who were evidently putting up a fight, though their efforts were in vain as they were being herded onto white buses. Despite their short time in the neighborhood, Ivory was aware that just across the street resided a police officer who, it seemed, was not exempt from the scrutiny of the UN's weapons enforcement authorities, given the presence of a parked UN vehicle right in front of his house. Looking back toward Jared, she could see he was focused on the police officer's house as well, and had a much better view from the top step of their porch. What is he looking at? She wondered, nearing the UN vehicle. Unable to see, she listened closely, but with so much activity taking place around them, she could not single out any one activity from all the chaos. Down! Jared screamed to Ivory, just as a gunshot rang out then another. Casting a swift glance back at him as his urgent shout reached her ears, she couldn't ignore the sheer terror mirrored in his eyes, a chilling foreshadowing of the impending danger. Responding instinctively to his desperate instructions, she surrendered her strength, allowing her knees to give way, her body gracefully collapsing to the ground. Throughout this descent, her unwavering gaze remained locked with Jared's until her form met the earth with a muted thud. Remaining in her crouched position, she watched with a shiver as a solitary gunshot served as the conductor's baton, initiating a deafening orchestra of chaos 
that resonated throughout the entire neighborhood. In front of her, the previously serene expanse of grass transformed, resembling a field of popcorn kernels erupting in unison, a visceral manifestation of the upheaval and conflict now seizing the once peaceful surroundings. Raising her gaze back to Jared, who had managed to break free and was sprinting in her direction, she caught a fleeting glimpse of his shirt ballooning like disturbed grass in the wind, just before a warm, wet sensation splattered across her face. No! she screamed, her voice carrying the weight of despair as he crumpled and collapsed beside her. Get ready to move, Jared whispered in pain, grabbing his side. You! You're shot! Ivory stuttered. Move to the bus! I'll be right behind you. Now go. At the command, go, Jared sprang to his feet, clutching his side where the bullet had traveled through his body. Whirling around, his attention fixated on the soldier who had fired at him moments before, oblivious to the imminent danger as his focus remained on a target adjacent to them. He failed to detect Jared's rapid approach until it was too late. With a swift and powerful motion, Jared's fist connected solidly with the soldier's face. However, this act of aggression was tragically overshadowed by the sound of a gunshot that tore through the air, followed by the gut-wrenching impact as the bullet found its mark in the soldier's chest, ending his life. Momentarily taken aback, Jared shifted his gaze to their neighbor, the police officer, whose name he now wished he had learned. The shared circumstance had formed an unspoken bond, and in that critical moment, the officer's identity seemed more important than ever before. Let's get to the bus. We have to get out of here, the officer shouted, picking up the dead UN soldier's weapon. Shaking his head in agreement, Jared turned to find Ivory still on the ground. You okay? Why are you not moving? Let's go. As shock threatened to engulf her, Ivory resolutely battled to retain her composure. In that moment of turmoil, the reassuring grip of Jared's hand intertwining with hers provided a lifeline of comfort and steadiness. Her concern for his wound, though pressing, didn't detract from her immediate task. She instinctively applied pressure to mitigate the bleeding, her movements driven even as bullets sizzled past or struck nearby. Amid the swirling chaos, the trio emerged as a distinct group, moving in unison toward the gleaming white UN bus, a symbol of safety amidst the overwhelming pandemonium. This vehicle had become a fleeting sanctuary for numerous individuals who shared the same desperate need for refuge. Danger hung heavily in the air, a tangible presence that sent shivers down their spines. The sporadic rhythm of bullets cutting through the air, narrowly missing or finding their mark on nearby surfaces, served as a haunting soundtrack, constantly underscoring the grave danger that enveloped them. Closing in on their objective, she felt Jared's hand slide up her arm and gently guide her alongside the bus as the officer took the lead. Slowly, she followed cautiously as Jared and the officer as they neared the open door. Without stopping, the officer jumped into the open door only to be blown back by a shotgun blast from the driver. Frozen in place, Ivory watched as Jared moved in even closer as she wanted to scream, No! A shotgun barrel appeared from the doorway. Not certain about the best course of action, she steeled herself for movement as Jared sprang into swift action. His hands moved with urgency, seizing the barrel's end and yanking both the driver and the weapon from the confines of the bus. With a tenacious grip on the barrel, Jared engaged in a tense tug of war against the driver, who was fervently struggling to retain his hold on the weapon. Observing the struggle unfold, Ivory swiftly calculated her intervention. She surged forward her steps imbued with a resolute energy. Her intention was to disrupt the driver's equilibrium and gain a critical advantage. In an explosive burst of motion, she directed her momentum into a forceful strike, unbalancing the driver and causing him to waver. However, in the midst of the tussle, the sharp crack of gunfire echoed once more, the weapons discharged disturbingly close. Despite her valiant effort, her trajectory was redirected, and she crashed down onto the lifeless body of an officer. Regaining her bearing swiftly, Ivory's focus snapped back to Jared. The initial plan may have faltered, but it hadn't been in vain. Her actions had disrupted the driver's grip on the shotgun, and she now saw that Jared had successfully freed the weapon. 
The sight of the shotgun in Jared's possession sent a surge of hope coursing through her veins. Propelled by a surge of adrenaline, she leapt to her feet, her movements fluid and swift. Her body seemed to respond to the urgency of the situation with a well-practiced grace. Immediately, her focus shifted to Jared as concern appeared in her features. During the chaos of the struggle, her attentiveness to Jared's condition had been momentarily eclipsed. Now, as the dust settled, her eyes honed in on him, scanning his form intently. She was searching for any telltale signs of injury, her gaze thorough and unwavering. Her eyes swept over every inch of his body, her concern deepening with each passing second. But as her meticulous search continued, a flicker of relief slowly replaced the tension that had gripped her. Her sharp eyes detected no fresh wounds, no sign that he had been harmed any farther during the confrontation. The breath that had been unwittingly held prisoner in her chest was released in a soft, unsteady exhale. The weight of worry that had momentarily burdened her was lifted. In the wake of the struggle, her focus remained steadfastly on Jared, her expression of relief. She knew that despite the turmoil they had just faced, they were in this together, their bond unyielding even in the face of danger. You okay? she inquired, her voice an amalgamation of concern and relief after this volatile situation. Racking another shell into the chamber, Jared pointed it at the driver and began pulling its trigger. I'm fine, but this son of a bitch isn't going to be. Wait. Ivory demanded not wanting to see any more killing. Jared's finger struggled to release its advance on the trigger, but hearing Ivory's lovely voice calm him enough to do so. Get on the bus and let's get out of here, he said, keeping his aim on the man's head. Not having to be told twice, she moved around her husband and boarded the bus containing nearly a dozen other people. We're leaving. Anyone want to stay? She asked, taking the seat directly behind the driver's seat. No, let's go. Get us out of here. She heard as all detainees answered her question. A fleeting half-smile graced her lips as she observed Jared's cautious steps, retreating onto the bus with the shotgun unwaveringly aimed at the now-disarmed driver. With a sense of restored control, he maneuvered back to the driver's seat, easing himself onto it. The realization that the bus's engine was already humming added to the urgency of the moment. He propped the shotgun against the dashboard, deftly managed the clutch, and shifted into first gear, initiating their escape. The bus rumbled as Jared pressed down on the accelerator and began to move. An overwhelming wave of elation washed over Ivory. Witnessing the initial hint of progress filled her with relief and joy. Involuntarily, she released a breath she hadn't even been aware she'd been holding since the very first gunshot resonated in the air. Yet the newfound tranquility was abruptly shattered. The tranquility she had savored for a fleeting moment was shattered by the sharp cracks of gunfire erupting just beyond the bus door. Her eyes widened, and time seemed to dilate as she comprehended the scene unfolding before her. There, on the ground, the driver lay with a pistol erupting with violent flashes of fire, firing off rounds, aiming at them as they distanced themselves. The sight was chilling, a stark reminder of the danger that still lurked just outside their haven.